Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. When we got ready to start, it says to pray for revival. And I thought about, about a preacher. Yeah, I'm going to tell a story. But I heard about a preacher that one time went to this church and he was holding a revival. And he was preached on a Sunday night. And when he got to preach, or uh, as he was getting ready to preach, it, he took up an offering. And I'm glad God had taken an offering for this story. But they... And then, and then as they passed a plate by him, he, he thought, well, I, I don't know. So he pulled in out of his pocket and put in a $20 bill, and it went on. Well, after he preached and after the service over, the pastor came to him and said, well, we don't have much, but we just feel led to give you the offering. And he said, okay. So he looked in there, and there was $26. And he said, pastor, I don't mean to complain, but there was there's 45 people here and there's only $26 in the offering and I put 20 of it in myself. He said, well, if you'd put more in, you'd got more out. <laughs> and I said all that to say this, the more that we put in and y'all are putting in, I, I can feel the spirit of God here. I can feel open hearts here. And that's how we receive from God is by putting in our lives and our hearts to God. Amen. Somebody loves me. Well, I'm in love with my Savior. He's in love with me. He is with me from day to day. What a friend is he. Watching over me while I sleep. Hears me when I pray. I'm as happy as I can be. Now I can say. Somebody loves me. Answers my prayers. I love somebody. I know he cares. Somebody tells me not to repine. That somebody is Jesus. And I know he is mine. You'll be happy if you will let Jesus have his way. He has work for us to do every passing day. Feed the hungry and cheer the sad for the sinner pray. You'll have joy like you never had, then you can say. Somebody loves me, answers my prayers. I love somebody, I know he cares. Somebody tells me not to repine. That somebody is Jesus and I know he is mine. Then at last when our work is done, he will call us home. To a mansion he has prepared, never more to roam. We'll sit down by the riverside, cares all passed away. Never a pain to bear, what a happy day. Somebody loves me, answers my prayers. I love somebody, I know he cares. Somebody tells me not to repine. That somebody is Jesus, and I know he is mine. Praise God. Somebody loves me and answers my prayers. Ain't you glad that somebody loves you tonight? Hey, man, ain't you glad that somebody cares enough about you? As we talked about this morning that he gave his life on the cross of Calvary. They sung that song and done that little recitation. That was beautiful. Hey, Amen. Three rusty nails. Hey, that they used those nails and nailed him to the cross. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to get up on that cross. He didn't have to be offered up as a sacrifice for you and I, but he did it because he loves you and I. And I'm glad that he loves me. I'm glad that he cares about me that much, that he would uh, offer himself as a sacrifice that I might be saved and be with him in heaven one of these days. Amen. Ain't you glad of that? Ain't you glad that you got somebody that cares about you that much? Amen. And so if we have somebody that cares about us, Amen. Then why would we not want to please him? Then turn with me to James, the second chapter.
It said that there was, uh, there was a man that came to church and, and every once in a while they'd ask him to lead in prayer. And when he led in prayer and he would finish up his prayer, he would always say, Lord, prop me up on my leaning side. And they heard him pray that time and time again. And finally, one of the deacons couldn't stand it. And they said, why do you always end your prayer, Lord, prop me up on my leaning side? He said, well, as you know, I own a farm out here a little ways. And, and he said, I got several buildings out there. But one particular building's been there for years. My great-grandpa built that building. And it stood out throughout time. Many of storms has came through and blew on that building. Many a ra much rain has got on top of it, snow, different things. And he said, and that building's always stood through the storm. But I've noticed here lately, I looked out there and I seen the building was kind of leaning to one side. And so he said, I went out there and I, I got me some poles. And I cut off poles just right and I propped it up on the leaning side so that it wouldn't fall over. And he said, when I got home, I got to thinking about that. Lord, I fought a many battles. I came through a few hard times in my life. And every once in a while, I feel myself kind of leaning to one side. So, Lord, would you prop me up on my leaning side? Amen. I want the Lord to prop me up on my leaning side because I'm not through serving him yet. I'm not through doing the work for the Lord. I tell people all the time, they, they say, well, maybe the Lord is about through with me. And I said, if the Lord's through with you, he's going to take you home. But as long as we got breath, as long as we got life in these bodies, the Lord is not through with us. So Lord, pop me up on my leaning side so I can continue to do the work for you. But in, in James, the second chapter with verse 8, it said, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Ye do well. Let us pray. Father, as we come before you this evening, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your spirit that we feel here tonight. I thank you, Lord God, for each and every one that is here. And I pray tonight that, God, that you would help me to deliver this word according to your will, that it might encourage and strengthen each and every one, Lord. And, Father, if there's one, Lord God, that... Father, that is having a hard time, I pray that, God, that you would give them strength that they can serve you a little better, Lord. Father, if there's one here, Lord, God is going through a battle, Father, I pray that you would hasten their escape from this battle. Father, if there's one here tonight that's not saved, and God, I do pray that you would deal with that heart, and, and before they leave here tonight, that they will know you as their personal Savior. Father, we ask all these things in your name, Amen. Praise God. This evening I'd like to use those last three words, amen, and add a little bit to it. I want to do well. I want to serve God well. You know, there's a lot of people out there today that claims to be Christian and says they're Christians, but they, they don't serve God the best that they can. And what is it that we tell our children when they go to school they come home and they got a B on their port card. We smile and say, oh, good job, good job. But if we know that child's got an A in them, it's not really such a good job, is it, when they can have an A on their port card. And how often as you and I, as Christian people, can do better than what we do, amen, in serving God, but yet we don't do it. I want to do well. I want to serve God the best that I can. I want to serve him. Amen. Praise the Lord. What, I want to do well. What do I want to do well in? 1 Corinthians 13 and 13 said, Now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These, threes, uh, these three, but the greatest is charity. So I want to do well in these three things. But the first thing I want to talk to you about tonight is I want to do well in faith. I want to do well, amen, and believe in God and what he says that he will do. When we go through storms, when we go through the trials of life, amen, I want to be able to do well. I remember a story, amen, of uh, one time when Jesus Christ was in the, in the ship. 
You remember it? He, they said, he told him to go to the other side. And when he, got, uh, when he got into the ship, he went down and laid down. And all of a sudden, uh, it says that, uh, uh, that uh, their storm came, the winds began to blow, and the Bible says they was even in jeopardy. They, they was in, uh, in, a, in a harmful way. So they run down there and they begin to wake up Jesus and said, Lord, we perish. And so Jesus got up and he rebuked the wind and he said, where is your faith? How often too many times that we let our faith delinquish a little bit and go down when we should do well in faith. I remember I told Brother Jim that I was going to tell this story and he said that he told you this one time before. But when we went down to Texas, Brother Jim said, let's go to Texas. Let's have a fishing time. And we took the ladies with us. They stayed in the hotel and Jim and I went out on the lake and to do some fishing. He hired a guide and so for the first day I took my boat. But for the first day we hired a guide. And we got out there and he took us way on the other side of the lake. And when we got over there, they all of a sudden they said a freakish storm come up. Nothing good. It, it wasn't supposed to be there, but all of a sudden a storm came up. Storm came up and the wind began to blow and howl. And, and, then, and the guide said, we better get off of this lake. And so we started back across the lake. And next thing you know, I, I believe them waves were six foot tall. I was scared to death. We would run up with and then we'd fall back down. We'd run up, fall back down. And Brother Jim says, asked the God said, where is your life jackets? Because we didn't have them on. And he said, back in that hole right back there. And Jim began to scramble for a life jacket. I was over there hanging on to this rail. He said, George, do you want a life jacket? And I said, I don't have time to put on a life jacket because I'm not letting go of this boat. Because my life was in jeopardy. I feared for my life. And you say, Brother George, you didn't have faith in the, in, the, uh, in the fishing guy. And I said, no, I didn't. I didn't have a bit of confidence in him. I thought he was going to drown us. <laughs> so we got back to the dock safely. And oh, I was so happy. And that freak storm, it went by. And so we decided to go back out. And he said, well, we'll take you back out there. And got out there and I caught one of the biggest bass I ever caught in my life. Oh, we was doing good. We was having a time. And one of them storms, it came back up. He said, we better head back for shore. And I said, I'll tell you what, you take me right over and drop me off. I'll stay on the land right here. I'm going to ride this thing out over here. But Jesus is different. We know Jesus, don't we? We know what he's done. There's been times that he has touched people's life, the woman with the issue of blood, and healed her, the blinded eyes of those who are blinded. He touched the crippled man and caused him to walk again. We know Jesus. And do we, should we not have the confidence in him? Should we not have the faith in him that whatever we're going through in life storms, that we can have confidence enough that he's going to see us through? He might not take you out of it. The three Hebrew children, when they would face the fiery furnace, God didn't take them out of the furnace. They had to go in the furnace. And sometimes, as much as we hate it, much as we dislike it, much as we just soon to go on and go somewhere else, God says sometimes we have to go in the furnace. But guess what? He comes in there with us. He sees us through it. Somebody said, if you can stand a pull, he'll pull us through it. The king says, how many did we put in there? And they said, three. And they're all bound. He said, I see four. And they're all loose and walking around. They're having a good time in there. Hey, man, they got joy in their heart. I, praise God. They got, love, they got that joy because God is in there with them. One looked like the son of man, son of God. So I want to do well in my faith. When I go through those times, I want my family to look at me and say, he's done well because he still trusted God no matter how hard it got. Don't we want to teach our children that? Don't we want to te teach those around us that, that God can see us through no matter what we go through? Because if we don't teach them, who will? 
Brother Terry Don, who's going to teach your children if you don't? We need to hold up. We need to have that faith in God. And, and I, I want to think I can tell you about faith. There's only one way that you can have faith. And faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we come to church and we hear the preacher. And when we come to church and we hear the teacher. But it's got to be more than that. We've got to go home and open it up for ourselves. And when we open it up for ourselves and we read it, not only just read it, but prayerfully read it and ask God to reveal it so our faith will increase and that we can trust God even in the strongest storms. You know, I, I can trust my wife to get a little thorn out of my finger. But it's a little harder to trust her when that big stick is in there. Something that's really hurting bad. But we need to learn to trust God like we for the little things as well, the big things. It's easy to trust God to just be there, but it's harder to trust God when we're in that storm and it looks like our ship is about to sink. So I want to do well. In trusting and having faith in him. I want to do well in faith. Let's turn to Romans the 8th chapter. Romans the 8th chapter. Verse 24. For we are saved by hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence is not seen. Is that not what it says? We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. When I have hope in something, when I have, have hope in something, I put my confidence in it. I, I, I take everything out away. Amen. I don't I begin to concentrate on it, and that's what I long for. And when I put my hope in Jesus, I don't look left and right, but I look unto Jesus. When I put my hope in for, to Jesus for salvation, I don't run to somebody else and see if I can get salvation there. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to make heaven except through Jesus Christ. And so therefore, I put my confidence, my trust in him. He's going to see me to heaven. Is he going to see you to heaven? He ain't going to lead you astray, is he? He's going to lead you right straight where he's at. He said that where I am, there ye may be also. So I put my confidence, my total confidence in him, amen, my total hope, everything that I, I, that I desire, hope for is in him. And so therefore I'm like the one that went into the field and found a great treasure. I sold it, he sold everything that he had to buy that one field because he put all his hope into that. And when I found Jesus Christ, I let everything else go because it's him that's going to see me into heaven. It's him that saved me. It's him that I've got confidence in. There's a lot of things in this old world I don't have confidence in. I've got a good car out there, and I hope it, makes me, I hope it gets me back home, but there's a chance it might not. It's mechanical. i got confidence in my wife going to fix me breakfast every once in a while, biscuit and gravy, because I'll tell you, that's how she got me. When we first started dating, she said, come over for breakfast. I went over and breakfast, his biscuit and gravy. I went over for his lunch or supper, and it was cheese enchiladas. I've been eating at her house ever since, and, but she don't fix me biscuit and gravy every morning. I hope she does. But what Jesus has promised us, he will not back out on. He will not tell you one day that he'll give it to you and then turn around and take it away. And so therefore we can have that hope, we can have that confidence, amen, in him and trust in him. 
then what do we have hope in? We have hope in peace. John 14 and 27, the first part of it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. And we live in a world today that does not offer peace. It offers confusion, discord. And that's what the enemy, the devil, or would like to do is bring discord among the brothers and the sisters of the churches. But God offers peace to us. He gives us that peace of mind. That we can, that we can don't have to worry about what's going to be on tomorrow. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow because we know that tomorrow is in His hands. I'm glad that I have that kind of peace, that kind of confidence in something. Amen. When have that trust in something that when I can't have trust in nothing else, because we don't know what tomorrow holds. I like to think that I'm going to be. Uh, be able to get up in the morning and face the sunrise and hope it's warmer than it was today. <laughs> Amen. I hope that it's going to be nice and I hope that, uh, that I get to live another day. But what if I don't? I have the peace of God in my heart that if I don't, then I'll be with Jesus. And I'll be with him. And that's the, wonderful, the most wonderful peace. I, I can't think of peace without thinking of a a wonderful dear sister that we pastored in Fredericktown, Missouri. One day she was diagnosed with cancer in her blood. And she, she instead of getting all upset, instead of being angry and all these things, and she might have, I don't know, I didn't think she did, but, but she wanted to do everything that she could with what little bit of time that she had left to serve God the best she could. She wanted to be in church. She wanted to work in the church like she always did. She just wanted to keep on. Until finally it came close to the end and she was in Poplar Bluff Hospital and she called for Sister Louise and I one day wanted us to come see her. And as we went up to see her, it was one of her good days. She was doing okay and she looked up at me and we got to talking and she said, if the Lord's will that I had to stay upon this earth, well, I guess I'll just have to stay. But oh, Oh, if he calls me home, I get to go home and be with him. I saw peace that day. I saw the true meaning of peace. Because she didn't have to worry about tomorrow. She didn't have to worry about what's going to happen when she left here. She had the peace of God in her heart and she knew that if she left this old world, she was going to be with him. That's the kind of peace that we can have. I want to do well in peace. Amen. I want to do well enjoy did you know that God didn't save you and, and, and bought you with a price for you to go around like a bunch of sad sacks he wants you to have joy now I know we can't laugh about everything and, and go hoop off on everything that we go run into there's sometimes I want to kick, kick the can around and there's sometimes I, I want to fuss at Sister Louise because I'm in a bad mood or a bad day and I don't do that much because she fusses back and her bark is a little worse than that but amen there's times that I have bad hair days if I could ever have a bad hair day but God wants us to have joy that joy that reaches down into the heart that nothing can take it away. Amen. There's nothing in this world can take it away. There's not an enemy and in, 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 in hell can take it away. But God gave us that joy that will last for an eternity. He said, my joy I give unto you. Well, let me read. I, I kind of I said that backwards. John 15, 11. I try to quote something there once in a while and don't get it right. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. And he didn't just give it to you to take it away from you, but he gave it to you that you could have for eternity. Not just in this life, but joy of the afterlife. But I'm glad I can have joy today. I'm glad that I can have joy. No matter what I go through in this life, I can still have joy in God. And that is process, my friend. That is process. 
You can't buy that. There's not a, no amount of money that can, you can purchase joy like that. So I want to do well in joy. I want to have that joy in my life that nothing can take away. I want to have that joy. And I want the people to see joy in my life. I want people to be able to see God in my life so much that they see the joy of God there. That don't mean I have to smile all the time. That just simply means I got enough confidence in God to go and take care of everything that I can rest at ease. That Praise God, when I get ready to go to sleep at night, I don't have to lie awake half the night worrying about things. I just let Sister Louise do that. Nah, she don't do that. She falls asleep before I do. But I want that joy. And I want, I want that joy that, la that lasts us forever. And then... I want to do well in this life and in the life to come. John 14 and 1 through 4, you know the scripture. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I want to do well. Amen. In this everlasting life. I want to do well in love. And this is important now. Faith, hope, and charity. I want to do well in love. And we fall so short of that. We really do. We fall so short. You say, but I love everybody. I love. But we fall short in love. Think about it. First, I want to do well in loving God. Mark the 12th chapter. Mark the 12th chapter, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And can you honestly say tonight, and I hope that you can, that you love God with every fiber of your being? I want to do well in that. I tell people all the time that when I die, Brother Randy, when I die and they put that tombstone over me, I want them, and they come by and they visit my grave, I want them to look down and say, there's a man that loved God. No question about it. They don't have to wonder if I love God. They know that Brother George loved God. I want to do well in loving God. Not because it's a commandment. And yes, it is a commandment. But I want to love God because he first loved me. He put no restrictions on his love. He just died upon the cross. He didn't put no restrictions on his love. He just, God just sent his son to us that we can have life eternal. So therefore, in return, that his love that is in my heart, I want to love him with everything that I can. And I fall short. I don't know about you, but I fall short. Too many times that well, I should take out a little time and pray. But I pray that, Lord, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep, amen, and go to bed. Get up in the morning. I'm a bear if I don't drink my coffee, but we ought to be a bear if we don't have a prayer. Do you love God with all have you given him all your heart? Have you loved him with everything that you got? Louise and I, when we was dating, she heard a song in Dallas, Texas, and, and she couldn't wait for me to hear this because we had already decided we was going to get married. And she said, she said, I want you to hear this song because this is exactly the way I feel about you. And I said, okay. 
And the song says, Jesus is number one in my life, so second place will have to do for you. I'm glad to take second place. I'm glad that Jesus is number one in her life because I won't never have to worry about Sister Louise. Never have. And that's what it's got to be. Jesus has got to be number one in our lives. We've got to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind and strength. And you'll know, you know whether you do or not. You say, Brother George, I fall a little bit short. We all do. But we can do something about that. How do you fall in love with somebody? You start getting around them. You start talking to them more. You start getting more acquainted with them. You get more acquainted with God. You get more acquainted with his word. And you can't help but fall more and more in love with him. And when you fall more and more in love with him, more better of a person you'll become to be. More better a Christian you'll become. I want to do well in my love toward God. I want to do well in love toward my family. Ephesians 5 and 25 said, Husbands, love your wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And then Ephesians 5 and 28 said, So men are to love their wives as their own bodies. And he that loveth his wife, loveth himself. Boy, I must really love my wife because I love myself. <laughs> it's time that we begin to love our families more and we fall so short in that in the United States. And I'm not saying here, I don't know how well you love your family. I don't know how well you love your wives or your husbands. I don't know how well you love your children. But all I'm saying is that we fall short of it. Because if you don't believe me, turn on the television and how many people turns on their own children and turns on their family. It's time that we love our family more and more. I want to do well in loving my family. I don't want my children to guess whether I love them or not. I want them to know that I love them. I don't want my wife to guess whether I love her or not. I want them to know that I love her. I want her to know it. I don't want my grandchildren to wonder if I love them or not. I want them to know that I love them. And sometimes I fall short even in that. You say, Brother George, how can you do that? When was the last time you called your grandchildren up and told them you loved them? When was the last time that you called that family member up and said, I just want to let you know how much I love you? We fall short. But I want to do well in loving my family. And this is a hard one. We talked about this in Sunday school. Who, where's our Sunday school teacher? I forgot your name, brother. But, but I want to do well in loving my neighbor. James 2 and 8 said, I just read it, said, If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, ye shall love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. I want to love my neighbor. And it was brought out, you know, we, we can love our neighbor. That don't mean that we have to hang around them or we have to like what they do and how they act and how they go about. But we must love our neighbors. We must want them to do well in the life. And if there's somehow or another that we can help them along the way, we should help them to do better. Do you got a lost neighbor that needs to know Jesus Christ? I want to love my neighbor so well that I be sure to take out that opportunity to share Jesus with him. Or at least give that, opportun uh, that effort to do so. What greater love can we show our neighbor than to let them know about something that is so dear to us? I want to love my neighbor. I want to do well in it. Matthew 25, 35 and 36 says, I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, 
and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me and I was in prison and you came unto me. Verse 40 says, And the king shall answer and say unto, unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch, I'm sorry, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, then you have done it unto me. How we treat our neighbors, how we treat those children and those across the fence, those downtown, it's the same as how we treat Jesus Christ. I want to do well in loving my neighbor. And then the last thing. James 13 and 35 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. Love one to another. I want to do well in loving my brothers and my sisters in my church. I want to love every one of them. And this is a friendly church. I, I haven't found one of you not friendly. You, you're real friendly. You like to shake hands. You like to smile. You like to eat. <laughs> you like to fellowship. And that's the way we should be. We should love one another and care about one another. There's not all, I can't always be there for my brother and sister, but I can always pray for them. When I know that they're going through a hard time, I'll be sure and pray for them. I'll be sure and call, their, bring them up before the throne of grace. The Bible says that we can bring them before the throne of grace. I'm going to be sure and do that. If somebody's hurting, I want to be sure and offer that prayer. And if I can, Give them a word of an encouragement. If it takes a hug, I want to give them a hug. If it takes a handshake, I want to give them a handshake. Sister Louise, if you want to come back. I'm reminded of a story. It says a little boy, they had a contest at school, and a little boy won this contest, and, and the contest was is, uh, who which one of these children done the greatest deed this week? And they chose this little boy, and when they brought the mother up and they got her to explain what he did, she said, this is what he did. The next door neighbor lost his wife. He, he was about 65, 70 years old, and his wife passed away, and it, it devastated him. It hurt him so bad. And one day, he was, this week, he was out in the backyard, and he was sitting in a chair. And my four-year-old little boy, some reason or another, just decided to make a beeline right straight to him. And I watched him, and he went over there and crawled up in his lap. And they said, for the longest time, don't know what they talked about. But finally he got down, and he came back. And I said, son, what was you doing over there? Was you talking to him and trying to cheer him up? I said, no, mom, I didn't say a word. But what was you doing? And she said, I helped him cry. Sometimes we need to help people cry. Somebody's shedding a tear. Should we not shed a tear with them? Our brothers and our sisters. If they're full of joy, if they've lost that coin and they found it and they call us up and say, rejoice with me. I found that which is lost. Should we not rejoice with them? But if they're broken hearted, Jesus said, I came to mend the brokenhearted. I, I want Jesus to work in me. That one that's brokenhearted and having a hard time, I want to love my brother and my sister enough that I can go to them and just say, if you want to just sit and cry, I'll cry with you. If you want to talk, I'm willing to listen. I want to love my brother and my sister. Let us all stand. The last point is, let me just read it. The last point is, I want to be just like Jesus. Mark 7, 37, it says, And we're, bound measure, and, and we're beyond measure astonished, saying, 
He, Jesus Christ, hath done all things well. He made both the deaf to hear and the blind or the dumb to speak. Jesus has done well. Jesus has done well in you if you'll let him. If you'll open up your heart to him. This evening, I want to do well. I want to serve him well. But first, I, I want to give an opportunity, uh, Pastor. I want to give an opportunity. You say, Brother George, I'd like to know this Jesus. I'd like to accept him in my heart, my life. Because I'd like to live that kind of life. I'd like to have that joy that you talked about. I'd like to have that peace that you talked about. i like to do well in these things. I can't do them by myself. I can't do them for myself. I have to have Jesus living in my heart, my life, in order to find that peace and that joy and that love that I talked about tonight. Tonight, if you'd like to accept Jesus Christ into your life and receive this joy and this peace that I talked about, this is a wonderful time because not only did I talk about love for our neighbors, I talked about love in the church and I guarantee you this church will love you. They will show you the love of Christ. If you don't know Jesus and you'd like to, please step out in the aisle and come forward. Just come and, and ask him into your heart and your life. You won't regret it. You won't regret it. It'd be the most greatest thing that ever you ever did in your life. If you'd like to accept him into your heart, would you come? I want Sister Louise to play for a moment. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? Don't be embarrassed. Don't, don't hesitate. Just step out and come up. The pastor's here waiting for you. He'll... He'll talk with you and pray with you. Would you come this evening if you don't know Jesus? You say, Brother George, I've got a little little away from God. I'm not where I used to be. And you'd like to come up and kneel or, or talk to the pastor about it? We'll certainly pray with you. you. Say, I'd like to rededicate my life back to the Lord and, and make that dedication to Him, saying, I'll, I'll do these things if I can. As Sister Louise plays, and maybe sing a little bit. If you don't know Jesus, would you come? If you've kind of slipped away, would you come? Rededicate your life back to God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sister Louise, say a short verse there. Would you come? Would you come? If you don't know the Lord, would you come? If you feel the need of prayer, would you come? Hallelujah. 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 Just going to pause just a moment. I I, I don't like to tarry too long because I don't want to you feel like you're under pressure to do so. You you want to you need to do it because you desire it in your heart. That you really want to do something like this. You, that you really want to accept him in your life. Hallelujah. All right, Pastor, go ahead. somebody back. Pray for somebody in your life that you want to see grow closer to God. Some of them may be Christians, but they just don't seem to be where they're supposed to be. And pray also that God open your heart up that every one of us can grow closer. Every one of us can have a fire in our hearts and our lives that we haven't had before. And all of us need that at times. So please be praying for that in between now and tomorrow night. And invite somebody. Come back again. 
Amen? Amen. Let's all bow our heads.